Southwest Florida. The seminar today will focus on protected citrus growing systems. Today's programs offer one CEU for pesticide license renewal and one CEU for certified crop advisors. I would like to thank Jean McAvoy and Julie Carson of the Immokalee IFA Center for their help and cooperation. The first presentation will be on protected citrus growing systems from healthy trees to high quality fruit. This presentation will provide an overview of the different screening and netting systems employed around the world to protect citrus trees against disease and to improve the fruit quality and yield. It will also address horticultural considerations based on our own experience. The presenter is Dr. Fernando Alferez. He is also from the Immokalee IFA Center. And it's all yours, Fernando. Okay, thank you, Monji. And thanks, everyone. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Let me see if this works. I have this one. Can you see it? Not yet. Okay, now. Yes. Okay, perfect. So thank you again. And uh, thanks for joining to, to this seminar on protected citrus growing uh, systems. Uh, I will start with a slide uh, that I always like to show to emphasize that uh, how unique is the situation in Florida right now. In Florida now, we have a combination of mature and young trees. And these young trees are being planted massively throughout the, the, the whole state. And both have different biology and, and different requirements. So for instance, young trees come from the nurseries healthy, so HLV free, and they are not producing yet fruit. In contrast, mature trees, they are already infected with HLV and they are declining in production. So the desired goals in both cases are different. In young trees, we want to keep them free from disease until they enter into production age or longer. If trees that are, that are coming uh, free from disease from the nurseries. So this, is, this, this reset uh, system is really interesting. What we have seen after almost three years of, of working with this system is that IPCs actually may prevent HLV infection. We haven't seen any, any plant uh, infected by, by HLV when we cover them with, with IPCs after almost three years. And uh, we can improve tree growth. What we have seen is that vapor pressure deficit is lower inside the covers. And then we have seen that we have increased photosynthesis so we can have increased vegetative growth. This was after 20 months of installing the, the covers. Okay, and after that, we changed the covers for bigger covers and just a few days later, we, we started to see some widespread uh, growth already taking place. Look how, how, the, how the trees came out from these smaller covers, but they started to, to spread the, the, the limbs once we, we changed the, the covers. Now, what is interesting is that if you look at the uh, vapor pressure deficit uh, situation inside the, the smaller covers, you can see that with the IPCs in general, the, the vapor pressure deficit was, was lower, as I, as I mentioned, and this allowed for more uh, vegetative growth. Now, here is when we replaced the covers. So the volume, was now bigger. And it was interesting to see that the vapor pressure deficit immediately uh, was equal to, 
to the vapor pressure deficit outside the covers. And that was, we suspect, because we had a, a full space to, to, to fill. But as the, as the trees started to grow again, you can see how the vapor pressure deficit is getting lower again because we have less space inside the inside the inside the bags and the vapor pressure deficit that is the the evapotranspiration is lower and this is a this is a system that uh, fits itself it retroaliments and and now probably we will fill again the 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 bag with with newer growth and we will probably have to a put newer bigger bags or just remove them for for the rest of our experiment as the as the trees are fulfilling the the bags again now we have seen that this is very interesting a canker incidence is much lower inside the individual protective covers than than outside and a greasy spot we haven't seen differences in, in, in incidence inside or outside the individual protective covers. Uh, we have also seen other pests inside the, the covers, but I will not extend over this as Dr. Jawad Kureshi uh, will be talking about that in, in, in depth uh, later in his talk. Uh, and now I want to, to focus on another, on another system that is CAPS, Citrus Under Protective uh, Screens. And in this case, um, CAPS is really expensive, but it allows to super high density. Uh, and and actually with, with intensive tree care. And, and, and this is a system that, that we are seeing increasing acreage planting with this system across Florida. Uh, still, uh, there are, we are in a learning curve and there are some unsolved questions for citrus growing under this system. Uh, so for example, we don't still understand how to get consistent abundant blooming, which are the fruit set requirements for all varieties that we are planting, uh, how to manage fruit quality, especially peel color, because with some varieties it's complicated to, to get a, a good peel color, how to eliminate seeds uh, under this system, how to manage the canopy of the trees grown in cups. This is challenging. And how to sustain production through the years. And, okay, with the aim of helping to solve this and other questions uh, that I just mentioned, uh, we started a project in our center and we converted a, a couple of old hurricane damaged screen houses that we have here in a new CAPS facility. Uh, this was done mostly by, by our uh, horticultural sciences program here in the Southwest Florida Research and Education Center. And uh, we have planted 400 trees of four different varieties, Sugar Bell, Early Pride, Tango, and Bingo. Uh, all of them grafted on, on uh, 897 rootstock. And uh, we selected this because they, they, they seem to have different, uh, different requirements in terms of blooming, fruit set, and canopy management. So what we are doing is uh, we are assigning some tree training using trellises, and we are saying also uh, some strategies to induce blooming and um, fruit set and also some some management practices to get better fruit coloration and I will talk about those uh, following this slide 
So this is what we did. This is uh, the, the, the disposition of the, of the trees. They are planted both in the ground and uh, in air pods. And we have, this is how, how they, are, they, are, they are arranged. We have 25 trees per row. Uh, and remember, we have uh, two replicated screen houses, 200 trees in each, tree, uh, in each screen house. And this is a view of our uh, airport trees. And this is the experiments that we are doing in, in the first phase. Now we are, we are actually, we already did our first run of bloom induction, and we did that through deficit irrigation. Uh, we have been doing fruit set assessment and different treatments to, to increase fruit set. And now we are, we are uh, assessing fruit uh, yield and quality. And we are actually planned, but we already started uh, to uh, train the trees with, with, with trellises. Uh, we have started to hand prune these trees and we want to maximize a fruit production through hand pruning and we are starting to do some experiments on uh, how to improve uh, external till color. So let me show you what we did with deficit irrigation. So what we did we we have a system in which we can we can actually uh, divide the, the irrigation in, in our spring house into halves so we can we can uh, shut down the the irrigation from one half and and play with that so what we did we started the treatment on january 10th and the deficit irrigation treatment was that we watered once every 15 days uh, to fill capacity uh, then we we allowed to to dry the the field and then we we watered again and we did that for two months now our control trees here was normal irrigation that was done every other day and the treatment ended on march the second so what we did see was actually that we were able to advance blooming in deficit irrigate, irrigated trees and so far what we have seen after fruit set is that we have increased, remember these are newly planted trees, so these are two-year-old trees. So this is the first time that these trees are blooming and setting fruit. So the bloom was not very abundant and the fruit set was not very abundant, but we are already seeing differences. And in Sugarbell, for instance, we have seen an increase in fruit set that is four times. And in Tango, we have seen a double a fruit set under deficit irrigation as compared to normal irrigation. A, in early Pride and Bingo, we haven't seen anything yet because we didn't see a much bloom this year. Now, a, we did also some fruit set management trials. And in Sugarbell, we have done this for two years, not in the screen houses, but outside in, in, in mature trees. And what we did was to, to bag single flowers to see if we could avoid seediness in these varieties, because when they are in the open field, we have, we have a, a, a big incidence of seeds, and you can count even 20 seeds per, per fruit. That, uh, we have seen that actually we can bag uh, the flowers. And if you bag the flowers and you do nothing, uh, you don't get any fruit set. But if you treat with gibberellic acid, uh, Progiv, for example, uh, at petal fall, you have a, an increase of, uh, in, in fruit set of 70%. You have a 70% of fruit set. In the case of uh, bagging branches, so you, you have a uh, self-pollination probably. Uh, if you don't do anything, you have, and this would be a, 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 
a similar uh, a similar situation to the one that you have in in a caps in a caps you would have a you would have a, a solid block probably of, of sugar bells so if you do nothing there you you have fruit set we counted around 30 percent of fruit set uh, but if you treat with GA3 at petal fall, you increase that to the 80%. So this is really promising. We have done the same treatments in, in our caps for tango. And as I told you, uh, these, are, these are very young trees. We didn't have much, much blooming in those trees, but still we had, we had some, some effect of, of GA3. Uh, we were treating with 10 parts per million and we had a 30% increase in, in fruit set for tango. We didn't see much, much success in, in bingo, but we are, we are still doing that this coming, this coming year that the trees will be, will, be, will be older. So what we are doing in the next coming months is we are we are starting to to assess fruit yield and, and and quality in our caps system and we are starting to do some color improvement treatments uh, for example a uh, deficit irrigation because there are there are some reports that even for color development deficit irrigation can help uh, we are doing also some treatments with aba to see if we can get a better coloration of the fruit when we degree with with uh, with ethylene, and we are doing the same thing with brassinosterans. And we have already started a canopy management, as as I just mentioned. And we are planning to to harvest at least for for tango and sugar bell this year a high quality fruit. And this is all that I had just to. To acknowledge and to thank a Citrus Research and Development Foundation for funding this, this project, to Southern, South, a Southern Citrus Nurseries and the Tree Defender Company for providing with the individual protective covers that we have been using, and to my colleagues, Dr. Ute Albrecht, Dr. Oscar Batuman, Dr. Yawad Kureshi, and Dr. Monji Sekri for their involvement in, in this project. And to my student, Susmita Geire, who is uh, doing most of the work that I just presented today. And that's all that I have. Thank you. And I'm ready for taking questions if you have. Concerning questions, we will leave them at the end. Hopefully, we will have some time at the end. We will be moving really to the second presentation. <clears> the <throat> presentation will be on ontological consideration for CAPS and IPCs. And the presenter is Dr. Jawad Qureshi, also from the Immokali IFA Center. So his presentation will cover the Asian citrus salad control using under protective screen and individual protective covers. He will be talking about monitoring for pests in CAPS and IPCs, and he will talk about the pest problems and how to manage those pests. It's all yours, Jawad. All right, can you see my slide, Monji? Yes. All right, thank you. Thanks for organizing uh, this event. And uh, like you said, I will be talking about the, the pest problems associated with uh, uh, protective systems, the cups, uh, citrus under protective screen, where the idea is that we can uh, bring the trees uh, from young age uh, into full production and uh, keep them producing for uh, several years. And then we have uh, this other tactic and the individual protective covers or tree defenders or mini cups. 
uh, where we are trying uh, to give two to three years to the young trees to, to keep them covered and protect them from Asian citrus salad and HLB. Uh, because without uh, such explosion, even with all the current methods of control that we have, it seems uh, uh, that it's, it's hard to bring most of those trees uh, into production. So just a brief introduction. Uh, we have the Asian citrus salad, and it's a vector of uh, HLB. Uh, most of you are familiar with these systems uh, and the open production system, the symptoms of uh, yellow shoots uh, starting in the trees as the disease progresses. We see the blotchy mortal on the leaves, uh, poor quality fruit, a uh, lot of fruit drop, and uh, this devastation uh, continues. We have been battling this vector and pathogen system for almost two decades now, considering when uh, Sillard got into our system in 1998 and later on HLB uh, in 2005. And we have lost more than 70% 70 for, 70 of uh, our production to this vector pathogen system. And that's why uh, this transition to uh, the systems such as COPS and IPCs uh, because uh, in the outdoor system, it, it seems difficult, very difficult uh, to maintain production and, and keep, uh, keep the tree's health and sustainability uh, in good shape. So we have three systems, uh, the open production system, the IPCs, and the citrus underproductive systems. Uh, they are all related. I mean, you know that we are using these IPCs, the growers are using them in their grows where they put the new trees or even the solid sets, uh, but they are not separated from, so you always have a risk of uh, several other pests, pests that we see uh, in the outdoor systems. And then it's, it's the same threat that we face with the uh, citrus uh, under protective screens. Uh, and there is a huge complex of citrus pests that is out there and none of these technologies that, uh, that we are testing or are advancing uh, give us uh, a foolproof security. So if we look at the overall pest complex uh, uh, that colonizes citrus crops, obviously Asian citrus salad is our prime target. Uh, then we have several species of aphids, uh, particularly uh, brown citrus aphid. Uh, it's the vector of uh, citrus tristeza virus, uh, which is another uh, extremely serious threat to citrus industries. Uh, then we have white flies, several species of scales, millibugs, uh, stink bugs, and leaf footer bugs. Uh, mites are another important group, uh, both uh, in the outdoor systems and in the protected systems as well, several species. Uh, other insect pests, we have citrus leaf miner. Uh, again, the larval feeding in this insect uh, is associated with the citrus canker, and that uh, definitely exacerbates the effects of citrus canker. Uh, there are several species of thrips, a very small insect and easy to get into these structures, uh, and fruit flies and beavers, uh, which are uh, more common also in the outdoor systems. It's very, like I said, none of these systems is foolproof and monitoring is important. So it's, it's very uh, important to be familiar uh, with the different life stages of the Asian citrus salad, because if uh, only few female gets into uh, one of these protected structures, and if you are not paying attention, uh, those populations could build up to very high levels in a very short time, uh, because they will also be protected from most of the biological control that goes outdoors. So the, the females, they lay their eggs in these newly developing buds and shoots, uh, which are very difficult to recognize with the naked eye. So you definitely need a magnifying lens to uh, examine those shoots very carefully. And it should be a good practice to do it on a regular basis. Uh, you may be using other methods like uh, citrus uh, uh, yellow sticky cards or the tap sampling methods. and. and getting or not getting the adults, uh, but it's not a guarantee that you are going to get every adult into those 
uh, sampling methods that, that you employ. So it's important to uh, examine those shoots and look there that if there are any pests developing in those. So they go through five nymphal instars also developing on those young shoots and before they become adult again. So the whole process uh, may take from three to four weeks depending upon the temperature. Uh, in the open production systems, uh, chemical control is the one of the primary methods of control and definitely we need that to suppress the populations and keep the industry going. Uh, but we have also seen uh, concerns with the pest resistance over uh, several years of the use of these insecticides and uh, mode of action. The costs are going up. We have seen significant reductions in the biological control and there could be issues with the environment and health as well. Some of the things that we have done in the open production system, because it also relates to the, these uh, protected systems as well, later on what you use in those systems or not, and how much protection you are gonna get. So these are some of the studies that we did for several years, some organic and conventional programs. Uh, you can see the, uh, the number of sprays that went into those programs. Uh, and for organic programs, it was not, we tested a program with just the organic insecticides and then the programs with in rotation with oils and soap. So those are relatively less toxic to the, to the beneficial organisms compared to some of the hard chemistry insecticides. So the level of suppression of the Asian citrus psyllid that we have seen. So here we are looking at the number of adult psyllids per tap sample. And I will explain this method later on when I get to the cups section because it will be important to use that uh, method in your uh, monitoring programs. So overall, we kind of observe similar trends, more reduction with the conventional program, uh, but not very far from some of the organic programs where we were using organic insecticides uh, in rotation with 435 oil or in, in rotation uh, with an insecticide also. In terms of impact of uh, those programs on the beneficial organisms, uh, Tamaraxia radiata, which is a parasite which kills the nymphs of uh, Asian citrus cellulite. So we are making releases of those parasites uh, in all those programs and more were recovered from the organic programs, the green bars there uh, and the blue bar is the untreated. So in those programs, significantly more numbers of parasites uh, compared to the conventional programs here in the red bar. And, and such effects have been seen in the other cropping systems as well uh, in, in Florida and other states. Ultimately, uh, those programs, uh, at least one of the organic programs where we were using organic insecticides with 435 oil uh, was able to maintain yields and in, in comparable uh, to the conventional program and uh, sometimes even better than the conventional program. So there is, there is, there is a definitely uh, impact of those programs, and the oils and the organic insecticides, uh, which, which could be useful depending upon the situation. Uh, there is a long list of uh, beneficial organisms, uh, particularly predators and parasites, uh, which colonize uh, a citrus crop. Uh, obviously, some of these larger predators that you see here, uh, like several lady beetles or, or the lace swings, uh, they will be uh, not able to enter some of these advanced systems that we are trying, the cups or the individual protective covers. Uh, then we also have several parasites, and uh, uh, there is a good possibility that we may see some of those uh, in, in those protective structures. So definitely biological control uh, will be less in those protective systems and therefore monitoring even becomes more important because even if the populations are starting at low levels and if they go ignored and not checked by the biological control, uh, then they can develop into uh, high numbers in very short times. So coming back to the cups, we, we have been working in this system uh, for now quite some time. Uh, the work is uh, under our NIFA grant uh, that is led by Dr. Arnold Schumann from uh, Citrus Research and Education Center. 
We have been working uh, with four COPS uh, protective uh, structures at uh, Indian River Research and Education Center and their respective controls. Uh, there are about 120 to 96 trees in, in these structures. Uh, some of the activities that uh, we are doing, uh, monitoring the populations of a pest using visual observations, sticky cards, pheromone traps, tap sampling, and uh, section samplings. Uh, the yellow sticky cards are, are, are used for the Asian citrus alert. They also get uh, several of the thrips uh, species uh, and some of the, the predators as well, if, if you have those populations in there. And then you can use the pheromone lures on these traps for citrus leaf miner. Uh, they are also very effective uh, in giving you information on the males of citrus leaf miner. But if you start seeing the males in, in your uh, protective systems, then that means females are also there. They are about the same size. And uh, uh, we have also seen uh, the follow-up with the larval infestations on the, on the shoots. Uh, then evaluate the impact of chemical control. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about that. There are maintenance applications that go in. So there are different objectives and it's also important for us uh, to, to look at those effects as well. But basically you can see what chemicals are effective against different pests uh, in our citrus production guide uh, and also check the labels to make sure uh, which are allowed in the, in the protective systems or not. Uh, we are also doing some work with uh, looking at the effectiveness of uh, entomopathogenic fungus and inter its interactions with uh, uh, some of the beneficial organisms. Again, that work is in progress, so I'm not going to talk much about that. Uh, we, we, we have looked at Isaria and Bivaria bassiana and uh, looked at their persistence, and it's, it seems that they can uh, uh, stay in the system on the plants within those uh, structures for about uh, two weeks. Uh, at, at reasonable levels and uh, with some predators, uh, we have seen that they were not causing much, uh, much damage to those uh, beneficial insects as well. So I will again emphasize that monitoring is very important. Don't think that you have uh, protected your crop with either the cups or with those individual covers. Uh, the pests are able to get in those, especially the small insects. There could be other events, the weather events, or the doors, entry doors opening for, for the people going in and out. And it only takes very few insects uh, to, to start the population and it builds up in very short time. So you can use the step sampling method. It's very easy. You have a laminated sheet, a white sheet on a clipboard. Uh, which you place at random locations in your tree canopies and they use a short length of PVC pipe to uh, tap them three times and you will see that the sailors will fall on to the sheet and you can easily count them. Uh, you can also see some other insects uh, like citrus leaf miner, although they are more uh, active and they can fly away quickly compared to the Asian citrus sailor, but still you can get the idea if you start seeing the adults there uh, we also see in the open system some of these large predators and the weevils, but there is less uh, chance of them being uh, there in those systems unless you are releasing some by yourself as in terms of uh, beneficial predators. Uh, so this, this is a good system to give you a quick um, uh, analysis of your system and see what's going on there. Uh, at the same time, like I mentioned earlier, you don't want to ignore uh, checking the shoots uh, because there could be only a few females in there and they may not get into your tap sample or into your sticky cards and then infestation starts happening. So, so you also want to check the shoots and buds uh, for eggs and nymphs of the Asian citrus uh, on, on a regular basis. Some of the organisms that we have observed and are studying in those systems, uh, uh, we did see uh, uh, some populations of psyllid, but most of the time uh, both systems afford a good protection. Uh, citrus leaf miner uh, can become common, uh, scales, mealybugs, thrips, and uh, some species of mites could also be a problem in those uh, systems. Uh, interestingly, uh, we have seen parasites of several of the pests in the cups, 
uh, which is very encouraging. Uh, we, we saw several of them for the citrus leaf miner, uh, for the millibug, and for the scales. Uh, predators, we are trying uh, different species of lady beetles uh, to look at their uh, behavior and impact uh, uh, with different pests that can colonize citrus and particularly in those protective structures because there are several questions that, that we didn't know before if these beetles would be good or not with some of the pests such as scale insects where you have the body covered with those armors and things like that. In terms of the Asian citrus salad, uh, you are looking at here at 2018 situation uh, and the, these orange bars are for the open system and the blue for the, the cups and uh, uh, we do see that there were some populations here uh, bear to high numbers at some time uh, in the year. Uh, the major reason for this happening was uh, damage from the hurricane Irma the previous year and the cups were left exposed for a couple of months uh, uh, needing repair and those populations were able to get in and established. And later on, we were able to clear those populations uh, with manual removal of the infested shoots. Uh, that's why it, it is important to monitor and frequently look at those shoots because let's say if you find one or two shoots colonized by a colony of developing names and there are 100 names there, considering a sex ratio of 50-50, you have 50 females there. And if you don't take those shoots out, those 50 females are gonna be enough to spread a good number of uh, cilids in, in your uh, protective system. So it's important to follow with all these uh, monitoring methods so that uh, you, you are doing your best at uh, monitoring uh, those craters. Uh, in 2019, uh, uh, we, we did not see issues like those, but still there were one or very low numbers at, at some times. And again, uh, for, for this, the reason for this was that early in the year, uh, there was a winter storm that caused uh, significant damage uh, to some of those structures again. And again, there was some time lag uh, for the repair and, and that uh, led the populations uh, in those, those systems. But overall, uh, we have seen that uh, a very good protection uh, uh, in, in those uh, citrus under uh, protective screen. Obviously, when, when we don't have the psyllid nymphs, uh, which are the target of the parastite Tamaraxia radiata, we are not gonna see how that parastite is doing. Uh, but during those uh, times of uh, when we did see the large populations, uh, we were able to test them and we did see that uh, they do a good job. Uh, with the releases, there was 29% parasitism in the cups and 9% outside. And we did cage those parasites with some developing colonies uh, in the cups. And also there, it was, uh, uh, again, uh, a high level up to 51% parasitism. So it, it, if, if you have such situ those situations, it, it may be good that if you are seeing the infestations to release these parasites, so that you can get some uh, contribution from those as well. We are looking at the citrus leaf miner, a uh, male numbers per pheromone trap. And uh, again, the orange bars are from the uh, open air or uh, the controls without cups. And you see that numbers were very high there, up to 400 males per, uh, uh, per uh, pheromone trap. Uh, compared to very low numbers in the cups. As I said, those males can get into the cups, so you do see some populations, but there was up to 80% reduction uh, compared to the outside system. Uh, there's a wide range of parasites that attack citrus leaf miner uh, in the open production systems. Uh, the two important are Nigalio minio, and there's another one, Igeniaspis citricola, uh, that we see the, the most parasitism. Uh, and we did uh, do studies to monitor the parasitism uh, in the cups and the open air. So here you have the, the graphs showing you the information from those both systems. And we do see that we were uh, in the cups, we were seeing uh, reasonable, I would not say very high level of parasitism, but still a, a good level and telling us that those parasites were able to get into those structures. It was less compared to 
what we were seeing in the open air, you need to look at the axis here. There is one that in the open air, it goes to up to 30, whereas the one in the cups, it, it goes to uh, around 15. And uh, we were seeing around 10% or less parasitism. But they were there, at least uh, those species, both uh, Nigelio minio and Igenia specificola, and there were some other species as well. Trips are an important pest. Like I said earlier, they are small and able to get into the cups. And uh, there are some flower trips and orchid trips um, that, uh, that can get into those. Uh, and uh, some of those species could be damaging, uh, causing a rain spot, damage to the rain. Um, and uh, there are some predatory species, uh, but we don't have much knowledge about those at this point in the cups. And then in the outdoor systems, we do see uh, a predator, a minute pirate bug. Uh, it's a very good predator of thrips, as well as the young stages of uh, several other pests. Uh, it's also available commercially, so it could be something uh, if, if you are someone interested in biological control, uh, some, uh, something that can be released in your systems uh, and then see if their populations build up and help with the pest control. Uh, their numbers, uh, they were kind of uh, equal, or even in 2020, they were higher in the cups uh, than in the outdoor systems. Um, and uh, so it's, uh, it's important to know that they are there, and uh, that's one of the pests that, uh, that in high number can get into high number in the cups. So you need to be monitoring and paying attention to them to take the measures uh, when needed. Uh, scales are another important group on uh, the soft scales. Uh, one of them that we have uh, common here is Caribbean black scale uh, in the open systems. And we did see some of those uh, in the cups. Uh, you can recognize the larger scales with this H-shaped pattern on their bodies. Uh, names initially, uh, they are uh, inside the canopy and they move out in the outer canopy. And later on when they mature, they move back again uh, uh, inward in the canopy. Uh, adults you will usually see on larger limbs. You can see a huge population here on, 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 in the picture below. Uh, they produce uh, a large amount of honeydew. That is another ind indication. If you start seeing that, you start checking the stems and, and, and in your plants to make sure that there is no scale infestation. Uh, in the outdoor system, we see uh, uh, this small black lady beetle. Uh, which is a good predator on the on the younger instars or the nymphs. Uh, it's another important thing with scales is, and I will go to the next slide and talk. Uh, I'll show you some of those examples that they they are covered, especially the armored scale that I will show on the next slide. They are covered with those hard covering on their body, and sometimes uh, the spray application that you make they may not be very effective. So you need to time them very carefully. Uh, they are probably be going to be effective only uh, when they're young ones, uh, the crawlers, they come out and uh, they, they, they are searching for the location to settle down. But once they, they, they grow and, and become large, then, then some of those uh, um, will not be very effective. There are some of the armored scales. Uh, we have small scale, uh, Florida red scale, purple scale. <laughs> All these species, we, we see them very common in the outdoor systems. Uh, we have seen floral red scale and snow scale uh, at, at very low levels in, in our cups uh, systems. Some of these lady beetle species could be very useful uh, for feeding on them. Like I said, the insecticides may not be uh, the ultimate solution to most of these problems. Like in this Florida armored scale, you have this armor covering the scale uh, really well, and unless uh, they are exposed, like their babies you see in the left picture down here, if they are wandering around, then then the spray material may be effective, but they, if they are covered, it, it may not be uh, uh, very useful. So, so, But these predators, we did not know previously how they will perform on some of these uh, species, and we started testing some of them, and you see that they have some very interesting behaviors, uh, both the adults and the, the larvae that they were able to go and remove those uh, armors from the body 
and the feed on the, the scales inside, the, uh, in, inside those coverings. So that was very, very interesting experience for us and also, also useful that we, if we start uh, releasing some of these predators in those systems and they establish, uh, then it will be a, a good benefit uh, for uh, controlling those pests. So we did do several experiments with them, with them and here is just one example uh, where we are trying to test them uh, with giving them different choices of uh, the scales with armors or taking the armors off and see if, if their behaviors or their performance changes. And, and they were doing a very good job in, in, in all those situations, uh, whether they were exposed to the scales with armor or without armor or, or the mix of uh, the two types. Mites uh, in the cups, uh, the common species that we observed were the rust mites. Uh, they are primary problems in the fresh fruit and their populations flare by use of copper and broad spectrum insecticides, uh, such as pyrethroids. Uh, the spider mites, the dry weather, uh, there are, uh, helps them. And, and you see these stippling and firing uh, symptoms on the leaves. But these were the two species uh, that, uh, that were common. Uh, citrus rust mite is the more, most abundant and then followed by the citrus red mite. We did see uh, two spotted spider mite, but at a very low level, I think, in one of the cups. Uh, the interesting uh, follow-up to this was that uh, I have a PhD student, she's working on that, and uh, our hypothesis was that we were not seeing uh, much uh, diversity or abundance of the pre uh, predatory mites in those structures. Uh, because of the protection by the cups as well as the, the ground cover diversity outdoor compared to the indoors. Uh, but we did see uh, five to six species of predatory mites uh, in the cups. And these are the aggregate numbers from both cups and outside. Uh, but the two species uh, that were most abundant were uh, Amblyceus tamatavensis uh, that you see here in the, the, the large blue portion and then the Tiflodramus peregrinus, the, the, the large orange portion here of, uh, of this uh, figure. And both, both these species are well-known predators of uh, mites and several other species. So, so that's encouraging that those predators are following those pest mites uh, in those cups as well. Uh, we are also doing some studies in the, across Florida at multiple locations. Uh, trying to find other predatory mite species uh, in the untreated systems, as well as in the organic production systems and the conventional production systems to see uh, what is the kind of diversity that we see out there. And if there are any candidates, which at a later time uh, can be mass produced and used for these uh, protective systems. And the news there is very encouraging because so far, uh, we have found, uh, I think, about uh, 23 or 24 species of uh, predatory mites uh, in the open production system. Coming back to this, uh, the abundance of these species uh, in the open and uh, closed uh, systems, the, in the cups, uh, it was interesting for those two species that were abundant, uh, the tamatavensis, Amblyceus tamatavensis, it was more abundant in the cups. Uh, compared to the control uh, outside, uh, whereas uh, uh, Tiflodramus peregrinus was more common outside uh, compared uh, to, the, to the environment inside. But if, if, if we break these into different times of years, uh, I think they were in, in reasonable number in both the cups as well as in the, in the open production systems at different time of the year. For mini cups, uh, I have been working with uh, uh, Dr. Farrizi uh, at the IREC, the Indian River, and Dr. Alferz here at the Swift Rec. Uh, and we also have uh, my, one of my own trial uh, in, in connection with the mulch experiment that we are doing. So we have plenty of uh, uh, information out there from uh, for the last few years. And what we have seen is that there was no ACP or HLB in those uh, protective uh, covers so far, uh, but we did see scales, mealybugs, mites, leaf rollers, and even uh, a garden armyworm uh, in, in some of those. 
So that's why uh, I will go back and emphasize that monitoring is very important. So you need to check them from time to time. Don't think that you have a system in place that nothing is going to happen. So if, if you are not paying attention, this population, you see a snow scale here, uh, developing to very high levels, and then uh, the larva of uh, for army worm developing to all the way to these mature stages and even pupating in some of those. So it's very important to keep checking them and also make sure that when, then when you tie those uh, individual protective covers at the base of the plant, make sure that those are tied really well uh, so that uh, no uh, insect is uh, coming, is able to get into those. So it, it's interesting how these pests uh, find their way uh, into with the, uh, with these uh, advances that we make in the in the in the technology, so so you have uh, these IPCs and the moths of that army worm. They come and lay their eggs in batches of hundreds, as you see here, circled in red. And then once they hatch, if there's few of those larvae, they are able to find their way in, inside inside the the cover. Uh, then you are going to not notice until you see a huge level of damage happening to those trees. Uh, later on, we tested those because uh, the idea is that uh, some of these structures will be used for different varieties. And so we, we tested the those fall army worms on, on a range of citrus, Valencia, Clementine, Lisbon lemon, sugar bell, Mineola, and uh, they were consuming all of them. Uh, okay. Uh, the consumption was less on the Lisbon lemon, but the most that we observed was on Mineola and uh, uh, Valencia orange, uh, uh, as well as on the Hamlet and uh, Clementine. So they were able to successfully pupate uh, feeding on, on those uh, diets and later on come out successfully as moths on uh, almost uh, all of uh, those uh, citrus. Another question that uh, I get from several of you is that uh, whether those sprays that we make, uh, whether they will be able uh, to uh, penetrate through those uh, individual protective covers and uh, uh, help with, the, with any of the pest control inside uh, those cages. And yes, definitely we did some experiments and you see the sticky cards here uh, that were placed inside those individual protective covers. And we did see a good coverage uh, inside those uh, 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 those uh, mini cages, and uh, that's a good sign. So uh, the regular application that you make, if, if you are targeting those rows, uh, those uh, will definitely help you with the, the plants that you have inside those cages as well. So if you are monitoring them, then you may not need to get to the stage where you need to really take those covers off and do separate sprays for those trees. But again, the monitoring is the key here. So overall, uh, we did see that the COPS and IPCs provide significant control of ACP and HLB. Uh, it's important to monitor those structures on a regular basis to check for ACP and other pests. Uh, TAP method and yellow sticky cards are useful for detection of ACP adults and uh, other pests such as uh, Trips. Uh, I'm sorry, I put citrus leaf miner here also. You may get some citrus leaf miner, but, but you will get their population real good on those pheromone traps. Uh, and then you can also get some mites uh, as well, uh, especially in the tap sample. Actually, when I put citrus leaf miner and mites, I was referring to the, to the tap method. Uh, visual observations, uh, critical to detect stillet, citrus leaf miner, and others. And the uh, citrus leaf miner pheromone traps uh, provides good information on the male activity. And if that is happening, that means the females are there as well. You should be checking for the larval populations on the young shoots. Uh, in the outdoor systems, uh, we have seen uh, with the effects of organic insecticides on, uh, with 435 oil on select control and yield. And uh, which shows that there's a potential of, uh, of using these uh, in all type of citrus, uh, including some of these uh, uh, protective systems. 
Uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, our funding source, uh, the US IFA grant uh, led by Dr. Arnold Schumann, uh, my collaborators, Dr. Uh, Johnny Farrizi and Fernando Alfaraz, and uh, my team members, uh, Dr. Salman, Ismail, the postdoc, my students, Emily, Jamar, and Muhammad Ali, senior biological scientist, Barry Kostick, and the research assistants, Monica Triana and uh, San Diego Moreno. And uh, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Koraishi, for the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Alferas, for your presentation. We are going to open it for questions. I ask Jean or Julie to unmute the participants so they can ask questions. And if you need CEUs, send an email to Jean. His email is in the chat box. You can contact me as well. And if you have a question, go ahead. They should all be able to unmute themselves, Manji. Okay. Or they can use the chat. Dean had to um, get off the call a couple minutes early, but his information's in the chat. Credit. Thank you, Judy. Anybody has a question? Yes, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, what? It, are there any plans with the uh, experimental cups work in Immokalee to do um, to get other mandarin varieties in there and, and see how they do? And, and I don't mean anything that's available now, but maybe you know some of this these new releases from USDA or um, IFAS um, get them in inside the protective structure, the cup structure to see how they will perform. Uh, yes, uh, well, actually now we have, we have these four varieties, but, but yes, as, as there is interest in other varieties, we can definitely plant them in our, in our structures. So this, this, this structure is, is designed and, and, and planned as a, as a tool for research for things that are important for the industry. So, so we can, we are doing things with these four varieties, but, but we can work also on demand if, 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 we, if we have that interest. Okay. Well, I would, I would just, I, I just know there's, you know, other varieties that are gaining a little bit of momentum now and, um, it sure be nice to be ahead of the curve with them to see how well they do in a cup structure. Totally agree. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? No questions. I would like to thank the participants. Thank you all for your participation. And see you next time. Stay safe. And again, if you need CEUs, contact Jean or myself. See you next month. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margie. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye, all.